All startups are under scrutiny and stress to have success right from the beginning. Medical startups have even more pressure to succeed because of the required processes and investment for getting to market. Between FDA approvals, human factors testing, end-user requirements, ever-changing landscape of technology, and the pressure for adoption, medical device companies need to be sure that their marketing matches what their device is capable of. Justin Starbird, the CEO of the Abley Group, a leading medical device and medical manufacturing marketing agency, joined the MedTech stage at IME East in New York City recently to talk attendees through how to create a marketing strategy for MedTech startups. Listen as Justin discusses the most important elements of any marketing strategy and specifically how they apply to the medical technology industry. Here is Justin Starbird. It is with my pleasure that I am able to introduce you to Justin Starbird, CEO and founder of the Abley Group. He will be speaking with you today on creating marketing strategies for medtech startups. Thanks, Lauren. Appreciate it. My name is Justin Starbird. As she mentioned, I'm the CEO and founder of the Abley Group. Um, thrilled to be here. This is pretty exciting. Uh, I've been working in the medtech space for years and it's really neat to be in New York City to talk about it. It's nice to be part of people too, like to see people. <laughs> uh, you know, and, and I used to do this a lot before COVID, so forgive me ahead of time. I'm going to get lost. I will forget what I was going to say and um, I will ramble. I will go down rabbit holes and get excited about certain topics. Hopefully you do as well because uh, I'm rusty at this, right? <laughs> um, before, I used to do it a whole lot more often, and you had a chance to get into a groove and do those sorts of things. Um, today, I live in Maine, uh, but New York is uh, somewhat of a homecoming for me. I went to school at Wagner College on Staten Island, lived in Hoboken. Uh, when I was here, though, uh, sorry, any Seahawks? No, nobody from Wagner? Um, you have green on, so I was really, I wasn't sure, you know, where. Uh, so, when I was here in New York back in 2004 or five ish uh, for school, you know, you didn't get to the West Side very often. Uh, there was Javits was here, of course, and there was no Hudson Rail Yard. There was no development. So this is all exciting. The only thing I knew about the West Side of New York was the Impound, which is just a couple blocks down. Because when you're in college, you park at the bar and then you forget where you parked, or you have to go back the next day to get it. And that was it. So that was the only thing I knew about the. Uh, about the west side of New York. So happy to happy to be here talking about really cool stuff. I'm, I'm always in awe of you guys. Uh, I get to tell stories for a living. Uh, you guys solve problems. You create medical devices, you create new medical te technology. You solve problems that most people didn't even know existed and make it a lot easier to go to the hospital, make it a lot easier um, to be cared for. And so I am so thrilled to have the opportunity to talk to you. Um, the Abley Group, pronounced Abley, uh, we are a full service agency and you know we work really hard to create content and strategy to drive new sales. Uh, so create actionable analytics and be able to measure you know what you're actually doing. So a lot of times in marketing, as I mentioned, we tell stories, but if you don't have uh, stuff to measure against, then how do you know if it's working? So that's what we do. Um, we're really heavy in med tech, but also in other industries as well. Um, so, you know, that's what we'll talk a little bit about today is how you marry marketing with sales as well. Uh, our services, as I mentioned, the full service, so everything from digital to creative stuff, all the really thing, you know, fun things. But then we also do uh, content strategy and social media and branding and all those stuff. I mean, what kind of guy would I be if I didn't have my red shoes and belt and lapel to match the branding of my company, right? So if you come up and meet me afterwards, my shoes have my name on them. So, uh, you know, that's all stuff that we try to help our clients with as well. So today, before I get started, um, you know, it was advertised as creating med strategies, marketing strategies for med tech startups. Uh, but a lot of this applies to existing businesses as well. Most times we work with existing businesses or folks that have been around for a long time. So looking out here, how many are in a company one to five years old? Or more, five to 10, or established companies? All right, so a little bit of a mix. Um, let's define what a marketing strategy is. When you're thinking about 
marketing, you know, a lot of times you think about social media or you think about individual campaigns that can be run, your emails, your websites, and those sorts of things. But really your strategy is taking all of what you do and making sure that it pulls in the same direction to create sales. Because at the end of the day, whether you guys are in marketing or you're in, in sales here today, you want to have at bats, you want to have people to talk to. So your marketing strategy has to align with what your salespeople are saying. If it doesn't, then I will, I have a slide later, it will make you laugh because I always say, show me a good salesperson and I'll show you bad marketing. Um, and we'll get to why that matters or why how we try to help prevent that. But your marketing strategy should lead you to at bats, should lead your sales team to opportunities to tell your story and close new business. And if those two things aren't aligned, then you know, you're know you gonna be paddling uphill for a long time. And you know, the other question we get asked often, and really today, is, is there a difference between creating a strategy for a startup versus creating a strategy for an established company? And I'll tell you, there's not a lot of difference because in both cases, you need to make sure that you know, your story and your branding is aligned with what sales are saying. So we always come at it from starting with the sales process first and working back because making sure that your sales guys are saying the same thing. Um, but with a, an established company, oftentimes the, when we come in to work with a client and they've been around for a while, we have to get their house in order or we have to help them uh, align you know, their new businesses. So they could have had an opportunity to have bought more businesses. We just went through a, you know, in MedTech, a huge opportunity for mergers and acquisitions. In fact, we've had five clients over the last 24 months that were either bought or sold and, you know, had to be enveloped into the new, you know, larger company. So what's been exciting about that is, you know, helping, uh, you know, the old guard reinvent themselves. A lot of times, you know, they were successful almost in spite of themselves. You had one or two people that were really good at sales. They were the CEO or the founder and they were like the rainmakers, right? And then you have uh, no process if, if they went away or they're not there anymore. And so, you know, for a startup or an established company, you know, a lot of the processes are the same. It comes down to what stage of the business is you, that you're in. You know, are you uh, looking for investment? Are you trying to prove out your project? Are you going through the regulations, uh, regulatory standards, uh, human factors? Are you in an investment round? The person before me, uh, Robert Ostring, was talking about, uh, you know, working on reusable devices versus, re, uh, versus single-use devices. And, you know, what part of commercialization are you in? That One of those requires a huge capital expenditure and you may be recreating or actually creating an industry as a result of that. On the other side, if you are still on the napkin and you're drawing out what it's gonna look like, well, then your strategy is gonna look a little bit different. So it's hard to sit up here in front of you, not knowing any of you and say, all right, this is what you need to do. So what I tried to do was, you know, think about where you start. And really no two companies are in the same spot, right? Um, everybody goes through the same stages, but oftentimes they just don't do it in the same order. Everybody thinks that their business is unique and different, but truly somebody else has done it before. We're always trying to copy somebody else's you know, thing. Before it was, hey, we wanna have the Apple product of this, uh, you know, of this uh, industry, or we wanna be the Uber of that industry, right? We're copying something else. So where are you and what stage are you in really depend, de defines what your strategy should be, how you align your messaging, what is important on your website, how you train your salespeople to speak to your pers prospective you know, customers. When I really stress with startups especially um, and established companies that are you know, re-identifying their identity, is what makes you special? Let's get the guy in the red. I mean, he's pretty sharp over there. That makes him special, right? He's standing out. I'm the guy in the red, I'm pretty special. Um, so I asked them to talk about what makes you better, unique, or different. Your unique value proposition, your unique sales proposition. It sounds really fundamental, but so many companies are so far off 
where they think what they what they are versus what the market thinks what they are versus what the customers think that they are. So I have them outline, you know, what those things are, and it doesn't align very well here. But you only need two questions to, uh, to ask or to answer uh, in order to get your next meeting, and that next meeting could be for the FDA regulations, that could be for investment, it could be for selling something, and that is what do you do and how do you do it? Right, that's what they wanna know. And are you gonna be able to sustain whatever you're promising me today? So that's your marketing. Your marketing is, hey, this is what we do, this is you know how we do it and what makes us special. Your sales you know, should be almost a rubber stamp at the end, like taking orders, right? That's what we all want is somebody to take orders or and it be such a process that that's what we get at the end. But you can only get there if everything else is aligned. If everything else is, you know, in order. It, and that's where, you know, a good marketing team will help you focus. Whether that's an agency or, or your team, you're looking for somebody that helps you galvanize your message. So then what you have your message, you're, you're uh, galvanizing your team because when you have a unique selling proposition that your leadership is behind, your executive team is, is pushing down, your employees understand, that helps everybody pull in the same direction. And that is what is so important. So oftentimes your CEO or the founder has an idea of where the business is going, what it is that we should be doing. But the next you know, chain of command has a different idea of what, what's really important. And then when you get down to the folks that are in the, in the trenches, it's something completely different. And so, again, going back and defining the stage of your product and the service determines where you're most important. I say don't fake it until you make it, right? That's another thing that you see out there all the time. What you put on social media is not real, right? And, and social media in, in uh, the medical device space and the medical industry as a whole has its place, and we're gonna talk about that in a minute. But, you know, being authentic is more important than trying to project yourself out there, you know, doing something more than what you're capable of, because it'll be found out really quickly, especially in this space. And one of the things that uh, is so unique about the medical industry versus other industries is that you have regulations for your product to go through for them to actually, you know, mark those things. So you have to be really aware and cognizant of how your messaging matches up with the performance of your product and what your product can, can actually do. I call this getting your house in order. So all the things that we just talked about, that's getting your house in order. Making sure that everybody is on the same page. When they come to dinner, you know, you're all eating the same thing. Um, and it's, it's a place where your business needs to live. I, what do I mean by that is there are, well, it's the next slide. Moving off of Excel, right? Oftentimes uh, in the medical, you know, technology, medical manufacturing, medical service space, of course, we're all dealing with different levels of regulation. We're all dealing with different levels of, uh, or different stages of where we are in that commercialization process. Being able to go from design, design to manufacturing and then you know, uh, something that's commercially viable. You're in it to make money. I, Robert talked about it before. I keep, I keep saying Robert uh, Ostring beforehand because I just sat through that. And he, he talked often about, you know, hey, you're here for the patients. You're here you know, to make a difference, but you're also here to make money. And I say get your house in order and move off of Excel because you have standard operating procedures for every other part of the business, whether that be for uh, you know, clean rooms or how you handle devices, how you track devices, how you handle the different stuff that comes in via your supply chain. But so oftentimes in this industry, I find that you don't have the same attention to detail to contacts, to companies, potential deals, your investors or stakeholders in the business, and certainly any other important aspects that are gonna grow your business. Sometimes that's talent. You know, where are you in the hiring process? So making sure that you treat the business development side just as specifically as you treat the actual design and development, and yeah, the design and development side of things is so important and yet it's so lost on so many companies in this space. I mean, look around. I mean. It, it, you could walk and talk to just about any booth here and you know they have a different process for doing things and that's okay like I said you know everybody goes through the same stages they just do it differently but making sure that you're 
your house is in order and being able to you know galvanize your team i keep repeating that because it is so important to make sure that you know you don't have people that are just clocking in and clocking out checking boxes and leaving by the same token you also want to make sure that what you're doing for business development has a process that is so so good that that's all they have to do to make sure that you're getting leads so it's that fine line and i say get off excel because you should be rooting your marketing in a crm i i don't want to out anybody but um we'll ask this question this way i did this talk in anaheim and i asked how many people are still on excel and sheepishly i had you know only a handful of folks that that raised their hand said a, def- a different way, how many people are using HubSpot or Zoho or Salesforce now for their business? All right, so good, that's great. Because when you can root it in a, in a CRM or root your marketing in a CRM, now you're able to define data that matters to you, right? Because what's so tough with Excel, although easy, or Google Sheets or any of the other programs is, you know, defining your website traffic, you go to Google Analytics, Switch to G4 as soon as possible if you haven't already. Um, you can define email opens. You can look at your social engagement and and uh, you know clicks for paid advertising. That you, you know those are there are different dashboards that you can use to plug all that data into. Generally speaking, a CRM contact uh, relationship management tool like HubSpot or Salesforce or Zoho or others is you know, a spot that pulls all that data together. So that when you hit send on an email, you can see what actually happens. There are one-off tools like MailChimp also that you know have different capabilities like that. You can use Buffer, you can use you know uh, Hootsuite or others to track those things. But generally speaking, now you have to go in and log into multiple dashboards. Now you're pulling reports from multiple places. With a with a good CRM, you are off of Excel, and now you can follow those deals from you know, shaking hands out there today, all the way through a potential deal in six months or longer. Oftentimes, you know, even us, you know, as an agency, when I meet you today or I met you in in Anaheim uh, in February, it's not like you're asking to hire me tomorrow. So you're building those relationships. And we're gonna talk about that too in just a second. But, you know, the CRM is so important because it also plugs into your best sales tool, your website. Now that's the front page of my website, and we're always changing it based on, you know, what's going on right now. So I took that uh, snapshot a few weeks ago to prepare for this because you know Lauren and the CR uh, and the Informa team required me to send the presentation in weeks ago. Um, I've had many ideas since then, and I couldn't add them all today. But um, I'm going to talk to some of them, so they won't be on the slides. But your website is your first great investment into marketing. It's open 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year. It helps you tell your story. If it looks good, people stay longer. So spending some time on how it looks is good. But the other thing that you see on our website right away is an opportunity for a call to action, which is that, you know, uh, why we're different, the red button there at the bottom. On your website, you need to have something above the fold too that gives a potential prospect or somebody that's looking at you and a reason to keep uh, to stay there right so that's our reason why what makes us different Um, it's also your first impression it's an extension of your brand it helps you tell your story it's also available for you to update all the time and I say that because oftentimes especially when you're just getting started or even if you've been established and you're you're um, Uh, things are getting stale oftentimes your website's the easiest one to refresh but a lot of it goes into that strategy that we're starting with at the beginning is making sure that everything is pulling in the same direction when you're smaller or you know uh, in the process of being very successful meaning that you've got a lot of business coming in updating your messaging falls down that that list of what's important what's a priority the problem is, though, that that, help, that starts to turn off the spigot of new leads that come in. So if you're not updating you know, your website, whether that is your resources, like a blog, or adding content like a white paper, in the background, Google also docks you for that. The search engines dock you for that. One of the elements of search engine optimization that you'll often hear 
is that you need to update your website because they're looking for new content. They're looking for relevant answers to whatever was typed in. It's even more important now that, especially Google introduced BARD, but then you have OpenAI that's also indexing your site as well. When you ask ChatGPT to do something, it's also looking at your site to see if you have an answer to pull inspiration from to answer whatever question you typed into it. And you know, right now it's never been easier to create a marketing strategy or put campaigns together, but it's also never been more difficult because of how much stuff that you think you have to update all the time. Your website should always be the first spot to be doing that, especially if you're starting out. So how do you tell your story? How do you, how do you start, right? Um, you know, there are a number of different ways to do it. Uh, there's a gentleman um, that's really well known in the med tech space, uh, Joe Mullings. He's, a, a, you may have heard of him. He does a lot uh, with, with creating core pieces of content for, for um, his clients. Another one is Gary Vee. Everybody, you know, if you're in New York, you know who Gary Vee is, right? So what he says is, you know, to create a core piece of content, whether that's uh, recording an interview, doing something like this. Right now, I got my tripod up there. I'm filming it, right? This will be a core piece of content later. We won't re we won't use this recording, but it'll be an opportunity to, you know, uh, for me to get better at what I'm doing and potentially transcribe it later. So what your core piece of content does is it helps strengthen either your product, your service, your brand or the team behind you. Sometimes what makes you so special as a company is the experience and expertise that the individuals that make up your team have. Often I find I'm talking to somebody and um, it's a new client, whether they've been a startup or uh, around for a long time, it doesn't matter. I'm in that first interview and they've, they finally said, hey, yeah, we want TAG to help us. And you're like, all right, ooh, yes. So I go in there and you're doing like a fact finding and stuff. And inevitably, you know, they say, well, if you talk to Dave, Dave knows everything about this business. He's an engineer, he's the, you know, uh, runs operations, he does everything. Dave fixes the product, he fi fixes the bugs, he does whatever we need him to do, right? He's the rock star that makes what you do so special. Everybody has a Dave on their team. Well. What's so hard is that because Dave's so busy all the time, you also need his insight and experience and expertise to write blogs. And he's like, oh, I'd love to do that. So, so now Dave is, is the you know, head dishwasher and cook and he's also serving, right? But now you asked him to write and that's not what he's great at. He wants to, but he doesn't have the time. So you ask for an 800 word blog from Dave and it takes three weeks or longer for him to do it because it took him hours to, one, he's gotta think of the topic, then he's gotta to outline it, then he's gotta start writing, then he edits it, then he goes and edits, you know, the document, and now he's not happy with it, so he has somebody else read it, and they edit it, and now he's busy and they figure out what he started with. And now the topic's changed because it was three weeks ago you asked him and you, you missed your deadline. So one of the things that, that we try to encourage our clients to do is re do recorded interviews. and. Out of a recorded interview or a blog or you know some other video like this, you can transcribe it, you can give it to a copywriter and they can write blogs or articles, you can submit it for PR, you can have a couple of interviews and create a white paper, a theme, post and distribute it on, on social, and then you can track everything, right? But that's, that's what a core piece of content does. So we have this nice little rainbow diagram of what that is it's, and I have that in handouts on the app I think so you could you could get that um, and it just explains what you do at each step but how do you determine what to talk about right Dave's got an idea or your marketing person wants Dave to talk about something but what you have to start and step back and do is ask you know why does that topic matter who's the audience and then who has the time <laughs> right so we have to make the time we have a client right now they're um, uh, in a different space, although they have healthcare applications. And we walked in and we did some of these same exercises I'm explaining right now in the last few weeks. And they are, are on the bleeding edge of technology, just like all of you. Um, they've figured out how to um, install OpenAI into businesses via the API. 
right? So it's not just you going to chat GPT and asking questions. You know, they actually go into your business and help you identify where that fits. It's awesome. Talking to them, often they're talking to CEOs. They're talking to the executive team about, hey, where can you really make a difference in your business with using something that's automated or, you know, uh, machine learning, right? So all of their content, however, is very technical and it's actually directed at engineers. So what the CEO is asking for and what CEOs are asking for to help run their business isn't matching up with what their content is. And that's been a huge challenge. You know, so we actually, we just got started, as I mentioned, we've only been with them for a, a couple months. And now we're going back and identifying why does it matter? Well, it matters because as I just said, right now it's never been easier to do marketing. You can type whatever you'd like into chat GPT and have it do what you're asking. But if you don't have a strategy, then that won't matter. So that's why it's still as difficult as it's ever been. So here's your secret formula. So I, I, I say this with kind of tongue in cheek because um, you know this is what we've developed for our clients, but I'm giving it to you today. So if you use us or don't use us, that's okay. You'll still get a great takeaway. These are the first five series that we put together relative to the podcast and recorded interviews for our clients. So the first one, we always interview the executive team and the leadership. You know, what it, and we ask them, basically the same questions. What do you do? Why do you do it? And what's your mission? We go through. And what's so fascinating is that every one of the interviews, even though the same eight to 10 questions are asked, it's completely different. You know, what makes, what, what uh, is their leadership style? What did they bring to the business? That's who's leading the company, but it also helps humanize the business. You guys are in high tech as I, st I started this off and I said, I'm in awe all the time because you're solving problems that most of the world doesn't even know exists, right? So you, you and you really work in a sterile environment. It is uh, unlike anything else. So how do you humanize that? So that's how we do that with the executive team. Our second series is with the partners, evangelists, and mentors. So think of the best, uh, not customers that you have, but the folks that kept you going through all this, whether they were the ones that continued to fund you through it all, or they were the ones that took you out to breakfast and made sure that you were okay, right? So you interview those folks uh, in and around the team and ask why does this mission matter? Why are you still involved? Sometimes, you know, med tech startups are 10 or 15 years sometimes just to get a, com a, a product commercial. So you have to have you know, the opportunity to be in this for the long game. And people that support you that are also in it for the long game. The third series is the users of the product or service. So thinking about your best customers. You know, a lot of times you're selling to you know, the hospitals or you're selling to you know, clinics or, you know, so why are they choosing your product over somebody else? So we call those testimonials. You die for those, right? <laughs> you want as many testimonials and social proof as you can possibly get. I call them content testimonials because when you bring them onto a podcast or do a recorded interview, now you're scratching the vanity itch of both your team and their team because you're giving them an opportunity to come on and talk about themselves. That's the best kind of, I think you guys are awesome. You know why? Because I'm talking. You're all listening, no one's talking to me, but I think you're great because you're engaged, right? That's. So when you leave a conversation, oftentimes if you were the one talking the whole time, you're like, oh man, that went great. I, am so, I did awesome. <laughs> but you have no idea, you didn't ask any questions. So having the opportunity to ask for feedback and get those questions and have them you know, uh, do that for you. Now going back to what I said in that previous slide with the, you know, the core piece of content, you can write articles and blogs and, and long form uh, white papers with customer information right in there. So that's our third series. Our fourth series is usually ongoing and we do that with your team and employees because at the end of the day, you need talent in order to execute on the mission and see the business through to success. So who makes that happen? Your employees, your, the team around you, but it does another thing for your employees because it keeps them engaged. You, you brought them on the podcast. Now, you know, now they had an opportunity to talk about their job what makes, you know, what their role is and why it's important. What, what's so neat about it though, is that 
then they compare notes. They listen to each other's uh, interviews. And that's really neat. So then they go to the water cooler or Zoom or whatever, like, hey, I, I didn't know you liked skiing. We're in New York. I didn't know you liked to, you know, skateboard. I didn't, whatever those things are. It's crazy what you find out uh, what they are. Or they're like secret, like awesome cooks. And they have a devout following on Instagram because of the recipes. I found out so many like really neat things about really smart people that had nothing to do with their business, but they were passionate about, whether that's Legos or what have you. Um, and that's ongoing. And then what happens with that piece is they share and they get to tell their mom, they tell their sister, they tell their family and friends, and that's on Instagram or, or Facebook as well. So now you, you're growing an engagement on a different platform. We'll talk about that in just a second. It also allows for future employees to see what kind of culture you have. Because now, uh, as you're competing for talent, hi Diana, up there, hi. Um, you have the opportunity to bring them in and see what they've done, right? And that's so awesome too, because they get the opportunity to, to get a, a sense of the business before you get there, right? And then series five is, you know, also ongoing and you're doing industry topics and current events and new developments and you know product launches and product updates and new services that you're offering and you do all of those things um, on an ongoing basis and then you can go back and recycle some of these so this isn't something that you do in day one this is something we usually start I don't know six months into an engagement and then this might be an outline for the first 18 months after that what those opportunities about creating core content really do though, is as I mentioned, they help galvanize the message. And I said earlier, a great salesperson oftentimes equals bad marketing <laughs> because they have to overcome messaging that's not congruent with what you're actually doing. There isn't a specific call to action for what their a marketing uh, uh, campaign is supposed to accomplish. There might not be follow-up. Uh, and you know, there even could be you know, burned relationships or uh, low product or service value. So they have to overcome all of that just to get to their commission. So whether you do it through a distribution channel or distribution model, or it's, you know, one-to-one -one sales, making sure that you're, that's why we started, uh, so here, this is what I was talking about, I got excited. So making sure that your marketing is aligned with your sales is so important. That's why at TAG we work from how it gets sold back to the origination and what's important. So now what? So now we've you know gone through and we've uh, identified our message. We have uh, determined the needs that need to be shared. Then we determine how we'll use each form of those communications. So, and we tie it together. So your ad strategy, your social media strategy, your public relations strategy, your trade show strategy, all align as different distribution channels for your content. It all needs to be consistent. They all need to have the same clear call to action, right? So that you have an opportunity to actually engage with somebody. And then a sound follow-up plan that actually invites folks to raise their hand and say, I want that. I want to work with you. I want what you do because you guys are great. And then you know, make it easy to do business with you. It's so exciting to be here today, right? This is a, you know, we're at a trade show. It, you know, we, we were, we didn't have that opportunity for a couple of years. So, you know, what a trade show does is just like being up here, it actually gives you an opportunity to see what your strategy does in real life, in, in person. I can see some of you are like really into this. Some of you, not so much. I wouldn't know it though, if I didn't get up here and try it. When you bring on a new, a new employee and you put them in the booth, what better way to figure out if they can make it if six hours of talking about what you do, right? That's, what, that's what's so great about a trade show. But a trade show is only as good as your follow-up. It's only as good as making sure that your branding and your messaging and the collateral and the materials that you brought all equal what you were just talking about. So that's why I love trade shows because it's like hand-to-hand -hand combat. I, you know, believe it or not, I didn't start off like, I didn't start off in the marketing industry. I, the reason I talk about sales first and you know working backwards from sales is because I got started in timeshare. <laughs> that is true, 
hand-to-hand -hand combat sales. Because no one walks into a timeshare presentation and says, honey, let's spend $30,000 today. This is going to be great. We don't own anything. We can go every other year, one week, sometimes to a place we might like or that we've only been once. Doesn't that sound awesome? It sucked. I, bet it, I, did, it for three or four, I did it for four years. And I was really good at it. And I hated it. Because I was the epitome of a, bad, of a, of a good salesperson overcoming bad marketing every single day. But I was on commission only. So if I didn't sell that day, if you didn't, you did not eat. There is no, I feel bad, here's some money for, for dinner. It is like, if you don't sell, you're out, right? You're, you need another job. And, and it's not like, it's not fulfilling. You're, you're, you're trying to push something on somebody that doesn't want it, doesn't need it, and is only there for the free gift. At least we gave out Disney tickets. I'll tell you what, though. Once a week, I had to go, this was in Anaheim. Um, I had to go once a week to buy uh, 250 tickets at the at the window, right? Well, Disney doesn't give you discounts, so you have to walk through the park and you go to the, the window, wait in line just like everybody else, spend twenty thousand dollars, you know, to buy your tickets, and then walk out. That was the scariest one because they say it's the happiest place on earth, but everybody's pissed. Nobody's happy, and nobody's smiling, right? When you're in the uh, in that waiting area before you're picking, in, what, in Anaheim anyway, you have two, two parks to pick from. And uh, when you're in the waiting area, at least, you know, you have the, the chance to, like, you've got to sprint through with all those tickets in your hand because they're going to they're gonna mug you. No, I'm just kidding. But um, that was how I got started. So, you know, making sure that you have a real sense of what you're doing, that, you know, that's what makes the marketing fun, right? Is when you get to tell a story about a product or service that solves problems that people really need. That's, that's where, it, that's why we made, I made the switch. So I was talking a little bit about social media as a distribution channel. And I was supposed to be a lot more eloquent switching from that slide to this slide, but you got to me today. So, um, you know, that didn't, didn't, didn't go as well as I thought it would. But, you know, oftentimes with, with social, uh, in medtech, it's a time suck. Everybody says you have to do it, um, and there's different ways to do it. And what can you talk about? What can't you talk about? You're going through different parts of the of regulatory, you know, stages or what have you. There are all the different channels that you need to be on, right? Whether that's Instagram, now you have TikTok, Facebook, uh, LinkedIn, especially. Um, how much time do you spend on it? And then how do you determine what your goal is? Right? LinkedIn, at least you have a really good opportunity to identify your audience. But, you know, for Facebook or, or Instagram, you're just kind of posting out there to the, you know, out there. Where does it go? <laughs> and so uh, when you're getting started in med tech with social, those are the questions and that's, those are the downfalls. Now, the positives about social media are that it helps you take all the messaging that we just talked about with those core pieces of content, I just told you, what do you do? You, you record the interview, you transcribe it, you write your article, you have your white paper. At every step, you can post about that. That starts, you know, you create engaging posts, you have the right hashtags, you, you also tag the right people. So today, if you were talking, if you have an exhibit or you were speaking today, you'd be, you know, way off if you didn't tag MD&M or Informa in some way because their team reposted every one of those or liked every single one of those or made a comment on every single one of those, which then got you more eyeballs and the opportunity for you to come, you know, here to listen to me today, which, you know, some of this is really good. Hopefully you're staying with me on it all. Um, but, you know, with your, your social media campaigns and what you're doing, the other part of the trap, if you will, of MedTech is that because the life is so sterile, right? You, you almost do that on social, but you know, people engage with people, they don't engage with products. And so making your content human is really important in this space. It, that's what gets people to, to like, share, comment. And all of that has to transfer to business development and making sure that all of your marketing assets move in the same direction. So that those interviews are the messaging that you want to go out. So that the same thing that's being talked about uh, in your offices or in the manufacturing space is also what your salespeople are saying. 
So spend time building the relationships. That's what I talked about, you know, the bad, uh, bad marketing equals great salespeople. The great salespeople can make a relationship instantly. Well, great marketing should do that for you. That should help build the relationship. It makes you authentic. It gives you an opportunity to engage with your employees and you're in it for the long game. It already took forever to get here, right? Just to get through the different processes of, of getting a device to commercialization. So stay with it and build relationships the whole way. So recap, what are the steps to create the marketing strategy? I can read it off for you, but you can see it. The most important ones are galvanizing your team with your unique value proposition, creating an awesome website to make sure that it's out there and you can share your story, which is what's next. And then finally, track, track, track your success and pivot as necessary. So rooting your business in a CRM, whether that is, you know, we're a HubSpot partner, we also do a lot with Salesforce. Um, Zoho is, has a, a lot of applications. Those are all great opportunities to track your success or the ones that you messed up on, right? Some of them don't work, but why? Can you see why not? Did, was it, they didn't have the same engagements as the ones that were successful? or they just hit the wrong audience? Or was it the time of year? I mean, we're going into a time of year once, you know, uh, end of June, July, and August, you know, you're fighting with vacations and those sorts of things. I always say Labor Day is the second new year, right? So build your runway for the next 45, you know, to 60 days. And after Labor Day, that's when everybody's back in the office. They're, they're ready to, you know, think about spending money for either the Q4, they've got to spend it because otherwise they lose it, or they are ready to start that new project next year, right? So build your runway now. And then, you know, that comes with building relationships. So next for you, if you uh, would like to have these slides or talk to us, here's, uh, here's what you need to know. Thanks. Any questions? Hey there. Um, Thanks a lot for taking the time to speak to us about this. Um, less of a question and a bit more of a comment, but I um, I noticed that there wasn't much content related to Google Ads in this presentation, and you heavily emphasized CRM, investing time and effort into CRM, and I, I wanted to um, reiterate that because I think it's really important that in the past few years, we kind of gave up on Google Ads since for the highly technical environment that we're in, it's kind of terrible. I mean, it was just a waste of money, and um, the um, the support team was terrible. So, I, I just wanted to mention basically that all of the time and effort that we took out of our Google Ads investments, placing it into investing in a CRM, and just writing down as many details as possible about every sales or marketing inter interaction has just been worth its weight in gold. Yeah. So, I just wanted to compliment the fact that I'm totally in agreement on CRM. You know, the more info you put in there, the better. You know, let's, for example, we had a conversation a few years ago that, um, and somebody mentioned, mentioned some alternative application just in passing, just for a brief few seconds. But I wrote that down, completely forgot about it. But it was still in this person's profile in the CRM. And when we reached back out to them for another reason last month, I brought that up in passing. And because it was logged in the CRM, it landed in a whole new conversation. And now we signed an NDA and. Hopefully we'll get lots of money for it, but just wanted to compliment you on plugging the CRM. I think it's super important. So, so I'm not against uh, pay-per-click in any way, shape, or form. We actually, you know, we, we do that, and then we have a partner that does some of our larger clients' larger spends, like ten, twenty, hundred thousand dollars a month. So where the CRM, why we, I think that is so important. So initially the topic was medtech strategy for startups specifically, and. Generally speaking, your AdWords, whether it's for Google or LinkedIn or what have you, are really important, but what most people do is they don't actually have it go into their CRM. So now you get these new leads in, but you don't have a follow-up sequence, or you don't know where they're coming from, or you don't know how they ended up in your box. And that is what the CRM is so, so great about. So we start there and then ask you later, once we have uh, a so a lot of the content stuff we talked about, I'm really heavy on content. That tends to be an organizational shift because if you're not doing it, it's really hard 
to then do it consistently. So when we start with the content or we, we start working on content, um, you're able to track you know, engagement, not engagement, uh, your web traffic uh, relative to hits on your website, et cetera, uh, on your blog posts, on your you know, resources and those sorts of things. So then we can actually determine, okay, what's important to our potential customers? And then we plug in ads because we know that that uh, content is something that's important to the potential customer. And it's, then you're building out a, a good landing page that converts and you create a sequence that allows you to follow up. When your salespeople then talk to those folks, they need to put in the amount of information that you just talked about. And that is, that you're right, it's worth its weight in gold. All right? Awesome. Thank, Thank you, you very so much. much. We appreciate you, Justin.